So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Wurzberger. I'm going to moderate this session. Um, we have three distinguished speakers with us this session. Um, we have Professor Jonathan Grandgaard from the Hebrew U, um, Dr. Michael Kegel, and Professor Philip Wexler. Um, and our session is called Interdisciplinary Applications of Fossilism. So, I'm glad to introduce Professor. Jonathan Garb from the Hebrew U. Um, professor Garb is a Gershom Shalom Professor of Kabbalah in the Department of Jewish Thought at the Hebrew University. Received his doctorate in 2000. He was a postdoctoral fellow in the Ben Gurion University of the Negev, guest lecturer at La Col de Zot. The Col de Zot Thank you. The Col de Zotitude, something something in Paris. <laughs> and the fellow at the Tikva Center for Law and Jewish Civilization in New York University. Um, his Lecture is titled The Hasidic Contribution to Psychology. <coughs> Thank you, Rachel. Um, so, I'd like to begin this presentation uh, by thanking uh, my friends, Professor Philip Wexler, uh, not only for, together with Rabbi Schmidt, organizing this exciting event, I think also a unique event, I would say. And not only even for about 15 years of joint work and study and reflection, but especially for his uh, marvelous inspiration. I still remember my excitement when Professor Moshe Edel was then my thesis advisor, um, kindly lent me his, his copy of uh, Philip's Holy Sparks, Social Theory, Education and Religion, and warmly encouraged me to read it. And even then, I sensed the revolutionary potential of his approach for the study of Hasidism and of Jewish civilization in general. Philip was essentially called in for moving from analyzing Hasidic texts through the lens of social science, of sociology, of psychology, anthropology, towards uncovering the internal indigenous forms of social thought that are found in the texts themselves. Uh, and then, as a second and vital step, critiquing and reevaluating Western theory and conventional approaches in light of ideas that emerge from Hasidic sources and other Jewish mystical sources. Now, this shift blended well with the direction of my own work, as I moved from my early work a kind of compromise between analyzing uh, Kabbalistic ideas of, of power and applying Foucault to them, and then a similar stance with regard to trans and Western hypnotic theory, and towards now discovering, describing Kabbalistic psychological thought more from within as an independent form of modern European psychology, basically to say that Kabbalistic and Hasidic psychology are independent forms of European psychology. Um, and this is expanded on in a manuscript that I have submitted recently. So what I'm claiming these days is that modern Kabbalistic psychology should stand alongside psychoanalysis and other secularized forms of psychology. And I say secularized because uh, another uh, book that I actually reached through Philip, uh, Suzanne Kirchner's book on the religious roots of psychoanalysis, shows that psychoanalysis is really a secularized form of psychology rather than a secular form of psychology. And what I'm claiming is that basically we have what the great late Israeli social scientist Shmuel North Eisenstadt, uh, joint inspiration I would say, um, referred to as multiple modernities. In other words, that psychoanalysis and Kabbalistic psychology are two forms of modern psychology that stand alongside each other, and therefore interpreting psycho Kabbalah through psychoanalysis is as, as legitimate, no less, no more, than interpreting psychoanalysis according to Kabbalah. So, in other words, psychoanalysis and other forms of thought, such as Hasidism, are products of modernity. Now, I will add that just one other rule that I've learned from Philip is to embed any form of thought, uh, for instance, such as sociology, social psychology, etc., and Hasidism, in a full context of cultural and intellectual history, that is to see ideas <coughs> in context as part of modern history. Now, this is why one of my critiques of some of the important research on Hasidism, which has been pursued for what is now just over a century, that is, if we count, let's say, from Martin Buber's book on Rav Nachman, 1906, we can say we've got about a century of the academic study of Hasidism, plus minus. And the, the, the problem that I want to isolate here is that for all of its richness and scope, which I'll, of course, expand on, Hasidism cannot be isolated from other facets of Jewish modernization. First of all, that of modern Kabbalah. And secondly, Musar. And third, the literature of Ascala, that was mentioned a lot this morning by Professor Idel, and Halakha, as Maos Kahana also discussed at length. And as I argue in my lecture, as I argued in my lecture in, in Philadelphia, in the first of these series of conferences, 
which I actually had the privilege to attend all three. Uh, so uh, what I argued today is that it's no coincidence that as Professor Lowenthal pointed out in his book on Chabad, the first book printed by Balatanya was The Laws of Study of Torah. So we start with Halakha. Now, um, the, I want to conclude the introductory, these introductory comments before getting, and then get into my main theme. And my main theme today is positive psychology. In the same decade as Buber's book about Rav Nachman, William James delivered and published his lectures on the varieties of religious experience, of course a classic in the field, and there and elsewhere in his large corpus, such as his subsequent book on pragmatism, James pointed at the healthy-minded form of religion and its beneficial effect on psychological life. And now he says at the beginning of the fourth lecture, the more complex ways of experiencing religion are new manners of producing happiness. So each form of religion is a manner of producing happiness, and especially it emphasizes new forms, but these modern forms of religion are new ways of producing happiness. And he contrasts the type to the type of a sick soul that probably he himself belonged to, uh, his own depressive experiences. Now what's important here is that James, as the author of a pluralistic universe, says there's a variety of religious forms that cover the range from joy to despair. And to use a halachic phrase, again, uh, there's place on the head for two sets of tefillin. This place on the head for psychologies of joy and psychologies of despair. Now, while sharing the stress uh, on the importance of William James, as in Philip's latest book, I have to interject two critical comments. The first is that James is very close to his contemporary, Max Weber, in positing ideal ahistorical types. So in this lecture, James moves seamlessly from St. Francis of Assisi to Cardinal Newman in the 19th century and Walt Whitman at the end of the 19th century. And my alternative approach is to regard healthy-minded or melancholy forms of spirituality as expressing historical tides within the ecstatic and tragic and always, uh, always raging sea of modernity. So it'd be unwise to see these two central options of a sick soul and a healthy-minded soul of joy and despair as separate figures or even as phases in medieval mystical psychology or very ed edge of modernity, let's say in the dark night of the soul by San Juan de la Cruz in Spain, we have the idea that we've got two phases, different phases of going through despair to joy, etc. But actually, as von Goethe puts it in the 18th century, two souls dwell within my breast. There is, there's room, again, there's room for, in the heart for two souls. Uh, and as Balatania puts it, he's the contemporary of Goethe, almost the same years, and he says it in, in chapter 34 of Tanya, there's no obstacle to be despicable and disgusting in one's eyes and broken-hearted and low in spirits at the time of joy, literally mamash. So mamash, one can be uh, joyful and broken-hearted, Lev Nishbar, at the same time. Now, James is part of a wider approach in psychology, which I would term pragmatist psychology, and was echoed in a bestseller in the middle of the 20th century, The Power of Positive Thinking, written by Christian minister Norman Vincent Peale, 1952. Now, he began to propagate this approach, which has an element of hypnosis in it, in highly popular radio talks in the 1930s. And I don't think that we can disassociate Peel's talks in the 1930s on the power of positive thinking from the historical context of the Great Depression and the shadow of war any more than one can do with the talks that were delivered at the same time, also very popular on the radio, the anti-Semitic talks of Father Charles Coughlin. Now, so, and, okay, so that's one point. And the second thing is that James himself speaks about a movement of his time, at the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, called the New Thought Movement. And he says it's a genuine religious power. And then he says the following sage comment, which is highly relevant for some contemporary forms of Jewish mysticism, uh, which relates to the end of the last discussion. It has reached the stage, he says, for example, when the demand for its literature is great enough for insincere stuff mechanically produced for the market to a certain extent, to be to a certain extent supplied by publishers, a phenomenon never observed, I imagine, until religion has got well past its earliest insecure beginnings. So the, the merchantilization is obviously a stage of self-confidence in the development of a religion. Now, James, Newforth, and Peel are all the intellectual and discursive antecedents for the movement of positive psychology that has strong adherence in Is Israeli adherence, even though they're operating the board at the moment, such as Tal Ben-Shachar. And there was also a Jewish branch of Newforth. Already in the beginning of the century, in the first decade of the 20th century, there was a Jewish branch of the Newforth movement. It was called the Society for Jewish Science. Now, happily for me, how do we the whole, what is the metaphysics? They describe God as an energy or force who permeates the un penetrates the universe. Of course, a description very close to the philosophy of Sefer Atania. 
Um, so what I want to say, building from the Tanya text on the coexistence of joy and despair with the far more complex psychology than positive psychology, I would say that Hasidism is a parallel form of positive psychology. So just say positive psychology has its own antecedents. In the 19th, 20th century, we've got an earlier movement of positive psychology in Hasidism. And this is what differentiates, one of the main things that differentiate Hasidism from its many sources in the Musa movement of the 17th and 18th century, as painstakingly and exhaustively uh, adduced by Mendel Pierkash. Now, I think that this understanding of Hasidism has implications which transcend the theoretical and reach both into the clinical and social realms, uh, but I must caution that Jewish psychology should always rest on a firm textual basis. Now, and we'll get to this connection between joy in the text or the joy in the text uh, later. So, uh, I want to speak now about the power of thought, because we spoke about the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, I want to speak about the power of thought and positive psychology in Hasidism. Now, the power of thought, as Moshe Edel wrote an article devoted to this topic, is a core tenet of Beshti and Hasidism. And the Beshti is recorded as saying that when, where one's thought is, one's presence is, and he's also, there's a pithy saying, a pro, attributed to the best, think good and it will be good. Now, seemingly using, the, uh, using terms from Weber, this is a form of inner-worldly mysticism. Because if a best is saying that where one is is a function of where one think, what, one, where, what is one, one thinking, that is, thought dictates where one is, so one can then easily mediate the divine presence for material world. It's very easy to be in the divine presence into the material world because one can be in a material world and instead of ascending to the heavens, one can actually just think about the divine reality and bring it into the material world. And so to use a Bestian scheme, the human dimension of the soul, Neshamot, can bridge the divine between divinity, Elohut, and the world, Olamot. And also linking to another Bestian discourse that Moshe Eder also de devoted an article to this discourse, the wall between the divine and the, the worldly, the wall, the wall between the world and God is also an illusion. So in other words, as all is ultimately a matter of thought, the power of thought can expose the illusory nature of the material world and reveal the imminent divine reality inside it. And by doing so, it also reveals the illusory nature of evil that the Best famously said is merely a chair for good, Kisei Latov. So in this reading, which tallies well with the Bulgarian interpretation of Hasidism, the gap between Bestian psychology and positive psychology narrows. Both of them agree that external reality is malleable. Both of them think that evil is far less compelling than in numerous Kabbalistic accounts. And really, everything depends on the cognitive scheme of the individual. Now, if this reading was correct, and I don't think it is, um, well, I don't, let, me, let me rephrase it, I don't think that it's necessarily representative of Hasidism as a whole, even though it can certainly be found in certain texts, but I don't see, think it's a very representative possibility. If this is correct, Hasidism would be susceptible to the critique of positive psychology in Barbara Einreich's book, Right Sided. It's got two titles, but the, I think, I can't remember which is the American edition, which is the European edition. Right Sided, How Positive Thinking is Undermining America. That's probably the European edition. <laughs> <laughs> so, Einreich has indeed noted the presence of a mystical notion of transforming external reality through the power of thought, and she locates this idea within a cultural cluster that she critiques as being a form of denial of discomfort in external realities, often of a political nature. And James Pavelski has noted in his study of James in positive psychology that James himself has a similar critique of what he calls mind cure, which is another ancestor of positive psychology, that mind cure is basically just like its descendant Christian science, is a form of ignoring in external reality when it's not comfortable. And for Chabad, at least, I think that Barbara Einreich's critique is correct, that Chabad don't have such a rosy view of the evil as maybe the Besht had, or maybe it's attributed to the Besht, and it's a question, soon we'll see what the Besht, maybe there's different layers and the Besht is thinking about it. So here's Balatania, chapter 24, quoting Isaac Luria. All the occurrences of this world are harsh and bad, and the wicked overcoming it are the shame of Rimbo. Now, surely one will ask the seventh Rebbe who's passing me commemorating here, balance this quote in the discourse on Tammuz 13, 1959, with the rabbinic saying, one hour of repentance and good deeds in this world is more beautiful than all the life of the world to come. So part of the answer will unfold when I'll move to the question of anomian and the law, and it can also, I can reinforce this answer by a brilliant analysis that by Elliot Wolfson in his Open Secret book that was mentioned this morning, that for the Rebbe, first of all, he says, he isolates the phrase repentance and good deeds. He says for the Rebbe, Repentance surpasses the perfection of the Torah, 
because it enables the transformation of evil into good. So this is a pretty semi anomian statement saying that repentance is above Torah because it can transform evil into good. And then Wolfson goes on to say that as for good deeds, even though on an absolute level the opposites of good and evil are not discernible and not distinguishable, Wolfson says a very important caution. There's no challenge here to Schneerson's commitment to the world of rabbinic halacha, which might suggest superficial comparisons to hackneyed portrayals of some earlier forms of Jewish utopianism, most notably Christianity, Sabbateanism, and Francism, which we heard about this morning. In the no so Wolfson says, rather, in the non-dual state, the human will is so aligned with the divine will that that basically performing ritual is no longer performed on command and obligation. So ritual becomes, isn't heteronomic anymore. It comes from within, but not that ritual is any way superseded. So, so therefore, I don't think that there's any contradiction between the, the approach of Atania towards evil and the seemingly uh, utopian approach of the Rebbe in the discourse from 1959. Now, I want to, in which seemingly the, the, uh, the last Rebbe um, neutralizes what Atania says, that the world is full of evil, by saying that actually our de good deeds, etc., is more than beautiful than the whole world to come. But according to Wolfson an analysis, and I think it's correct, he's not really doing that. But I want to go back to the best. In his pillar of prayer, which has been reduced in a now uh, produced now, sorry, released in a meticulous annotated English edition, which often introduces contemporary concerns into the translation itself. And here and there, in certain points, I correct the translation because it introduces Buddhist and feminist ideas in the translation itself. Uh, as for Buddha, that's a la Buddhism, yes. Uh, the best writes, at times a person works only in smallness. That is to say, he does not enter the supernal worlds at all, but rather thinks that all the world is full of his glory, and that he is close to him. And at that time he's like a child, that his intellect is only slightly large. And <coughs> even though he works in smallness, he works in great adherence to the Kut. So this is, I think, uh, let me maybe let's follow it with my hand out. I think it's over there. Yeah, so, uh, 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 oh. Could I trouble you just to, uh, to give out this handout of mine? Uh, oh. yeah. Everybody's got it. Ah, oh, fantastic. Oh, he's already worked on it. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Okay. So, so this was text number one. Okay. So let's have text number one in front of us, um, and I'll analyze it a bit. The state of smallness, which is where the Kabbalists say, the forces of judgment and restriction, this is where the much vaunted indwelling of God happens. That is, the whole story of the indwelling of God, of immanence, belongs to the state of Katnut, and this is often presented as the core Hasidic doctrine, but the Besht relates it here to Katnut. In this state, one needs to use a power of thought to bring God close, just like I said before, and thinks of God in this world and brings him down, rather than ascending to God, with the way the Besht does in his famous epistle on the soul ascent, which has been much analyzed in scholarship. And then, this is one quote. The second quote is number two which I think is a parallel. When one is in restricted conscious, constricted consciousness, it should also be with, this is Kalush's translation, by the way, uh, it should also be with great adhesion to the divine presence, Shechina. Then in one instant one can think of the higher worlds and immediately find oneself in those higher dimensions. For accordance with where a person thinks, this is where one finds oneself. And if he or she, now this, I, I say that this is of course a mistranslation because the text clearly says Hayah. Now, the translator in his preface says he, he's, he's mistranslating in order to correct the mistaken impression that the, books, the, the texts were written originally for men. Yeah. However, just a basic historical facts about the state of knowledge of Hebrew among women in the 18th century in Eastern Europe precludes this interpretation. It reminds me of a, a very nice text that uh, Daniel Reiser brought a couple of weeks ago in which, uh, in the West, the term Yidden was translated as every human. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so if he or she would not be in a higher world, he, he or she, again, haya, who haya, would not be able to think in that dimension at all. Now, this is a rather difficult text, but I want to interpret it as follows. Um, the... It's, 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 it's the same thing. It's the same thing. I, I think that's what, that's what Kalish translates. Again, we see a slightly Buddhist tinge of translation. Uh, I'll give a, a stronger example later, which is nice, but again, historically, it's problematic. Uh, the Kut, which is always presented as a central tenet of Hasidism, the connection to the imminence, to the Shechina, to the imminent God who resides in the world, and the Kut, again, presented as a core ideal of Hasidism. All this belongs to the state of smallness, because the minute one reaches the state of greatness, one realizes the true power of thought. The true power of thought is by instantly ascending to the higher world. So for, uh, let's say, a more, I would say, possibly like Chaviva Padai interprets the epistle, there's possibly a more popular layer here, which is based on the Kut and connection to the imminent. 
and the layer for the elites is that of contemplation. And there one realizes the full power of thought that just by thinking about being in the higher worlds, one can ascend to the higher world. Because the best says epistemology uh, is preceded by ontology. So that if one wouldn't be in the higher world already, one wouldn't be able to think about it. So the mere fact of thinking about the higher world indicates that one is already in the higher world. And this is the true, I think, the true elitist form of Bershtin Hasidism. And of course, this is a more popular level, which is based on imminence and vikut. So in this reading, the goal of Hasidic practice of a mystical elite is otherworldly rather than innerworldly, literally otherworldly of ascending. Why? Because this world is harshly dominated by evil. The shame of Rimbo. So therefore, the aspiration is to go beyond this world. Uh, and this is why, in the word of the psalmist, which is in, uh, in Psalm 23, which is said by just about all Hasidim in the third meal of concluding third meal of Shabbat, which in Chabad isn't always literally a meal, but uh, so it says to, the, the goal is to dwell in the house of the Lord, Shifti Vavet Hashem, beyond Gates El Mavit, beyond this world, which is the valley of a shadow of evil. Okay, so that's one thing, the whole question of, uh, of positive psychology. Uh, now, a second thing I want to get into is the law, a second major difference between, which I see between Hasidic psychology and positive psychology is the salient souvenomian, because if it's one thing that Buberian reading neutralized uh, is the presence of the law of halakha, that one could read Buber's books and not even realize there's such a thing as halakha almost. Um, now, Again, in the manuscript I mentioned, I discussed the, the pleasure of the law, and here I want to move from Chabad to the branches of Lublin, the various schools coming out of Lublin. Now, first of all, Tzvi Elimelech Dinov writes in the introduction to Bnei Soschar about the friendly, delicious, pleasant flow of the influx of holiness. So this is positive psychology, but he writes, it's according to Sederaz Manim, it's according to the, the, which he reinterprets not as a cosmic order, but as a ritual order. The, the order of the festivals, which is what all of this book Bnei Soschar is about, that's a place where you locate the pleasure. That's where the pleasure descends according to the order. It's not an anomian process, it's a nomian process which depends on the, uh, the festivals. Now I want to bring another text again from the same world of the branches of Lublin, from Avon Bonstein of Shochachov. And this is one of these Hasidic Kalachists that Moses was speaking about. He writes an introduction to his uh, very deep composition on the laws of Shabbat, a late time. And he writes as follows. And this is text number three. I've heard some people strain from the path of reason with regard to the Holy Torah, in saying that however, whoever, it should be whoever studies and innovates and takes delight in this, in study is not studying Torah for its own sake as much as one who studies for the sake of a commandment without pleasure, that is a heteronomic uh, mentality. For one who takes delight is mixing in his own pleasure. But this is a well-known mistake, and to the contrary, this is the basis of the commandment of studying the Torah, to be happy and joyful and take pleasure in one's learning. And then the words of Torah absorbed in one's bloodstream is the internalization of the Torah. And since he enjoys the words of Torah, he becomes adhered to them. And when one studies for the sake of commandment and also takes pleasure in one's study, this is study for its own sake and is entirely holy, for the pleasure is also a commandment. So the way I'm reading it, he's saying that one should study Torah for the sake of a commandment, but the commandment is to take pleasure in the study of Torah. So it's a circular reasoning. Now, I think Rabbi Avram in his time was responding to pietist views of Torah study, so he has to stress that pleasure is also a commandment. I think in today one has to stress, even in the academy, that study is also a commandment. <laughs> <laughs> and that being commanded is also a pleasure. <laughs> okay, so a final difference between positive psychology and Hasidic psychology lies in the question of human agency. Because Barbara Elbright, in a critique, she says, positive psychology has what she calls a harsh insistence on personal responsibility, Obviously, this is the ideology of the present form of capitalism, that there's personal responsibility, so uh, all responsibility for social and individual ills lies on the individual, because if people would just learn how to think differently, all these ills would imagine they're not really part of the structure of society. Now, in my reading, which follows that of Rivka Schatz Offenheimer, Hasidism belongs to the quietest branch. Again, when I say Hasidism, I don't mean that every single branch of Hasidism, etc. I mean Hasidism, grosso modo, as a 60%, 65%, I don't know. Uh, belongs to the quietest branch of the mystical family, uh, together with the Catholic movement of quietism and the Alumbrados movement in Spain and the Pure Land Buddhism and various other mystical movements. So for positive psychology, the focus of positive psychology is that everything depends on the power of thought of the individual. And for many branches of Hasidism, one can only really make things happen through divine grace. But it's a big difference. Now, before demonstrating this point in detail, I want to address the... Um, I want to say why I made this comparison between Hasidism and Quietism and Pure Land Buddhism, etc. Uh, uh, despite my critical comments about introducing Buddhist terminology in translations. 
Um, let me bring a quote. The quote is as follows. Regard thyself as a son who has left his father, and wandering far, uh, I don't think I brought this in a quote because this is like a surprise, I didn't bring this in a handout, this is a surprise quote. Uh, so it goes like this. So follow with me, please. Regard thyself as a son who has left his father, and wandering far has at length fallen in with the army of his enemies. They have made thee a miserable captive and cast thee into the filthy dungeon. Thy father himself, moved with pity for thee, has left his household, and will he become an exile and a wanderer in search of thee? So we've got the father who leaves his heavenly palace in order to descend into a filthy dungeon to redeem the captive. So where's this from? Tanya 46? Right. Yeah, it's like Tanya 46, no? But actually the source is spiritual exercise and devotions of blessed Robert Southwell, a 16th century Jesuit. Now, what, how the parallel between 16th century Jesuit text and Tanya come about, I can't go into that here. Uh, it's a complicated question. There's more phenomenology than history going on here. But uh, there is a historical explanation for similarity, but I won't give it here. Maybe in the Q&A. Uh, so let me return to Hasidism and bid one more quote from the Pillar of Prayer. Uh, by the way, this is where I've got the Buddhist critique here. Um, and now this is in front of us. This is uh, source number four. There are those who pray in despondency due to excess of black bile, marash chora, overcoming them, and think they are praying of great awe, so people mistake the marash chora from, for yira, for awe. Likewise, there are those who think that they have prayed out of the great love of the Creator, but it is due to their overworked... Now, this word, this word is absent in the text itself of the verse, but it fits, fits the context very well, so it's, it's fine. Red bile. They, they've got too much red bile, mara duma, so they think they've got love of God. However, if one is in a state of love of God, and out of this, a sense of self-effacement, now the text itself is actually busha, which is not self-effacement, but shame, descends on him or her, again, the same problem, I love, then it is good. So, observe how it is that all befalls you. I refer to you not to the fear and awe that you arouse within yourself. The true awe, however, is experienced at being seized by a shuddering, trembling, and out of this awe of sudden realization, and of course this Buddhist term is absent in the text, one loses orientation momentarily and does, what know, does not know where one is. At times, tears well up by themselves. But when it is not like this, it is nothing. It's so again from a pillow of prayer. So contrived melancholy or ecstasy in prayer is simply biochemistry, as they would say today. Uh, over, overdose of some chemical element. And true fear or love of God is manifested in falling, but it's a spontaneous shift, and tears that fall by themselves. And here one recalls Ehrenreich's critique of the false nature of positive psychology, that constantly, positive psychology, she says, constantly needs to be pumped up. It's not a spontaneous thing. It has to be pumped up by seminars, by self-help books, by other products, by a shopping cart. So one can bring much supporting evidence from the text, from, from this text. This text of the best very much reverberates in the Mittler Rebbe's uh, the book has been translated as a tract of ecstasy quite a while back already. Do you, do you know what was the Hebrew for despondency? Despondency is, a, is a, I think it's a tzvot. I think it's a tzvot, yeah. A tzvot, yeah. Now there's also a text by Rashad that I'll bring in another article about shame, which is very, very, very good parallel to this text by Babesh. And I want to just give one more Hasidic text, again through one of the schools of Lublin that my own ancestors on my father's side belong to, Ishbit uh, Seradzin. And Rabbi Yaakov Leiner writes in his Bet Yaakov, and I think this is also here, number five, is sometimes desire and joy enter the heart of a Jew, so you know if it's translated as Jew, uh, without any reason. And in truth, this grows from God beginning to build good, and from this his heart was moved towards God. So without any reason, it's a completely spontaneous occurrence. It's not contrived in any way. Conclusion. Um, do you have a paper time? Excellent. 15 minutes. Sorry, 15? Okay, I'll slow down. Okay. <laughs> so, um, now as Philip Wexler has taught us, to use Hasidism as a resource does not mean to reinforce prevalent trends in Western culture. But it's not as if we're going to now look in Hasidism and whatever's fashionable in Western culture will find the Hasidic source. Uh, positive psychology well serves the powers that be, as Einreich has shown. And now, all the things that I spoke about today, the emphasis on the law, the emphasis on the, evil in, the true evil in outer reality, the emphasis on the st textual study, and the emphasis of, on otherworldly cosmology and the emphasis on divine grace, which goes along with it, all these can inspire critical stance towards views that are dominant in Western society. And the Schnellson family was renowned for its fiercely independent stance, while never shirking the burden of civic engagement. 
Uh, and this carries over to all those affiliated with him, as Jan Feldman has shown in the important work, Lubavitch as a Citizen, The Paradox of Liberal Democracy. So despite this uh, uh, not choking the burden of civic engagement, Friedrich Rebe commented, combated Soviet tyranny, and while the Menachem Mendel supported Israel in its trials, he never sanctified the state and often questioned the policies of its leaders. So, therefore, what I'm saying is that Hasidic psychology can be seen as a subversive force, no, not necessarily as a force which reinforces the status quo. Um, and I'll say one more concluding comment. It's fortunate for the study of Hasidism that due to Sholem's relative disinterest in, uh, um, in Hasidism, it remained in what the famous historian of science Thomas Kuhn called a pre-paradigmatic state. Uh, there is in other places we have a Sholemian paradigm on the uh, Lurianic Kabbalan expulsion from Spain, etc., and which was Sabbatianism, which was then afterwards challenged. In the case of Hasidism, I don't think a paradigm ever really got established. Um, so since uh, this is, uh, Speaking about Hasidism, I do have to tell one story, I guess. I remember when, when Sholem Library was first opened, I asked the librarian, Esther Libes, where Sholem studies on Hasidism. At the time, I didn't have, have a separate shelf for them. After, possibly because of my question, they gave him a separate shelf. After the, the, the shelf was even published as a book. Um, and she said, well, Sh uh, Sholem didn't like Hasidism. And I think that was a very honest answer. The, uh, <laughs> so, now I think the pre paradigmatic state is actually very logical because of the huge complexity and diversity of Hasidic teachings. Uh, it's, it's difficult to construct one paradigm about Hasidism. So, I think we're in a, in a much more advantageous situation than rather than challenging some kind of dominant doxa, we actually re respectfully and collegially engage in an open discussion. And I think bringing together scholars from inside and outside academia is a very, very good way to go about it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.